Today we're going to talk about the righteousness, peace, and joy that are in the Holy Spirit. This verse from Romans 4, 14, 17 just came to me as I was waking up yesterday morning and it's given me a lot to think about in terms of what does the church look like, what are the qualities that we're to emphasize in the church. So let's read it in Romans 14, 17. For the kingdom of God is not a matter of eating and drinking, but of righteousness and peace and joy in the Holy Spirit. Paul is making sure that the church understands the kingdom of God is not about material things. So even if we have to handle situations that, that have to do with material things, that's not what the kingdom's about. The kingdom is about establishing the spiritual people of God, bringing people together, bringing more people into the kingdom. And so rules about whether you are allowed to eat something or not allowed to eat something, those aren't what the kingdom's about. So Romans 14, Paul explains all that. That's not what I want to focus on. What I want to focus on is what he says the kingdom of God is about. Because there's absolutely no doubt that these qualities should distinguish the, the church everywhere in the world. So the qualities of righteousness and peace and joy in the Holy Spirit, that's what the kingdom of God is about. So everything else we do is an opportunity to express righteousness, peace, and joy in the Holy Spirit. What I eat is an opportunity to handle it, especially when there's differences amongst Christians, in a way that shows righteousness, peace, and joy in the Holy Spirit. So I want you to think about this in the sense of, this is your life if you are a child of God. And let's see what God wants to change, transform, improve, correct, fine-tune, so that this is what describes our church, because we're part of the kingdom of God. And I want to see each of us agree with God's word and then welcome whatever the Spirit is doing to make this real in our lives. We're going to start with these, uh, these three basic expressions. Uh, righteousness. Righteousness here is a state of being. In other words, it's not so much the actions you do, it's what your state of being is. If you are righteous, you will act righteously. So, it's a status of legal rectitude, which means moral integrity, moral correctness, moral straightness, the right way morally, that satisfies the moral requirements of God's character. So, the essence of righteousness is, righteousness is God's character, righteousness in us is being like Him. So God is way more concerned about you becoming like him than living by rules of conduct that in your heart you may not be like him at all. It's about actually having the state of being righteous. So in the kingdom of God, God gives us the state of being righteous. And this is huge because so many Christians are living as if they haven't got this yet. Right? Like, anytime we're bad, what do we think that does to our relationship with God? Instead of looking at, I already have this. It's a state that we are in. The kingdom of God is about righteousness. You are in that state. And now it's just a matter of growing up in it. So righteousness, in a sense, is, sense isn't something you have to pursue. It's something you have to live. You live what you've already been given. It's, it's in you to be righteous. You have a new nature that is created in Christ Jesus to be righteous and holy in God's sight. So, once you get this, that the, the kingdom of God is about this and it's already there, then you can, in a sense, freely let yourself just grow up in it. So, in Romans 1.16... Paul, I think Romans 14, keep, keep in mind, Paul's developing a thought here. He begins in Romans 1.16, For I am not ashamed of the gospel, for it is the power of God for salvation to everyone who believes, 
to the Jew first and also to the Greek, which just meant that Paul, as a Jewish Christian, now understood that the gospel was for the Jewish people. It isn't the law for the Jewish people and the gospel for all us poor sucker Gentiles. It's everybody needs the same gospel. The gospel alone is the power of God for salvation. For in it, the righteousness of God is revealed from faith, for faith. As it is written, the righteous shall live by faith. The point is that when Paul later says the kingdom of God is a matter of righteousness, he's already made very clear that the gospel brings you into that righteousness. So if you've received the gospel, guess what? You already have the status, the standing of being righteous in God's sight, because that's what the kingdom of God is. Now we know that Paul develops this in that one aspect of righteousness is we are justified at the point of our conversion, right? And we are declared righteous. That is the foundation of our freedom in growing up in righteousness, is I'm already declared righteous. I don't have to do anything to fix my righteousness problem. It's already fixed. Now I just have to grow up. And I think a lot of times when Christians struggle with their identity in Christ, negativity, uh, old thoughts that we were taught as children, we have never understood this, that the kingdom of God is about a righteousness you already have. Along with justification is sanctification, which is you're going to keep growing up in that righteousness throughout the course of your Christian life. Glorification is one day that will be perfected when you will be 100% as righteous as your standing was the day you were saved. So it's like your standing is righteous, you're going to keep growing up, and one day you'll completely fill the same righteousness that's already given as a free gift. So there's, there's freedom in that when we get that. And the gospel is about this righteousness of God, not your righteousness. So when we get held back because we keep looking at our unrighteousness rather than God's righteousness, we're just in the devil's playground because he loves to accuse the brothers of Christ on all the things that are wrong with us to keep us from seeing everything that's right with him and that that's where our hope lies. In Philippians 3.9, Paul is talking about being found in Christ after he had discovered that he was persecuting the Messiah he was saved and is found in Christ. And then he says, not having a righteousness of my own that comes from the law. And there's a reason that, that God chose Paul, a Jewish religious person, to bring the gospel to the Gentiles, because now the Gentiles know from a Jewish person, you can't be righteous by the law. So when other Jewish people would say, you have to keep the law and the gospel, Paul would say, no, I've tried that. I, I was persecuting the Messiah. If, if you try and keep the law, you're denying the crucifixion of Christ. And so Paul's so clear here. I don't have a righteousness of my own that comes from the law. Why then are so many Christians trying to earn their standing with God through what they do? When the most, the, the, the chief example of a Jewish person living to the highest standards of the law would say, that's not the way I want to approach Christ now. There's no way I want to stand before God based on how I keep the law. Because I have no righteousness through that. And the message is to all us Gentile Christians, quit trying to act like your relationship with God is based on you keeping some law. So, Paul's quest of standing before God is, I do not want to stand before God with a righteousness of my own because then I'm doomed. Instead, I want the righteousness which comes through faith in Christ, because that's mine. It's 100% secure in Christ. And so right away, we don't give up righteousness. We don't swing to the cheap grace church that says you don't have to be righteous. We say, I don't have to be righteous by the law. I have to receive the gift of righteousness that is by faith in Jesus Christ. And that makes my standing before God secure. So when I stand before God in the judgment, I know He will see the righteousness of His Son in me, and that means I'm secure forever. That's the righteousness I want to stand in God's presence, knowing 
is mine and it's by faith. I don't have to earn it. I just receive the gift by faith. The righteousness from God that depends on faith. It does not depend on works. Okay. So, the kingdom of God is a matter of righteousness. It's a matter of living in the righteousness that has been imputed to us, given to us, put upon us, clothed over us in Christ, so that we are now seen as righteous in God's sight. We are justified, declared righteous in God's sight already. The kingdom of God is about that. There's a lot of freedom there. Okay, and peace. So, peace is harmonious relations and freedom from disputes, especially during the absence of war. Now, we know that when we were sinners, we were not at peace with God. We were his enemies. We were against him. His wrath was against us. But when we became children of God and we are made righteous, well, now there's no animosity. The thing that stood between us and God is gone completely. 100%. If you are truly a born-again Christian, there will never be a time in your life where God holds your sin against you. He may discipline you in love, but nothing of your sin stands in the way of Him loving you. Because your righteousness is already secure in Christ. Romans 5.1. I want to talk about the peace with God first. Because if there's righteousness and peace in the kingdom, well, the righteousness is a gift of God, and it gives you peace with God. And so you have to see in the kingdom, every child of God has peace with God. Romans 5.1, Therefore, since we have been justified by faith, we have peace with God through our Lord Jesus Christ. So the justified by faith is the righteousness you've been given as a free gift. So the, the kingdom of God is a matter of righteousness, which you receive when you are justified by faith, and because you have that, you have peace with God in the Lord Jesus Christ. I hope that we can see that if we do not have peace with God in an experiential way, it's because we don't understand righteousness through justification by faith. And I hope that we can look back and say, well, if I don't feel at peace with God, either I'm not a Christian because I've never received the gospel. If I've received the gospel, in it the righteousness of God is revealed to us. So if I don't have that righteousness, I'm not a Christian, but I could be. Here's the gospel offering that to me. Or, as is often the case, a lot of people who've received the gospel have not understood what they've received. It's like an orphan coming into his adoptive home and he just doesn't understand yet how secure and, and loved he is because he's still got all those old thoughts off the street that are, are making him doubt and feel insecure. But God's Word keeps telling us, you have peace with God through Jesus Christ because you've been justified by faith. If you ever think, my peace with God is based on whether I'm living a righteous life, that's not the gospel. That's actually contrary to the gospel. Now, God might be stirring up my conscience and making me feel miserable about things I'm doing, but in a context that I'm totally at peace with Him. Like, it's an amazing thing to think. The, the thing that caused animosity between you and God is gone when you receive the gospel. And when you're justified by faith, you have peace with God. The kingdom of God is a matter of peace for everyone who believes in Jesus Christ. So we can't settle for less than that when this is actually what the kingdom is about. In 2 Corinthians 13, I want to talk about peace with God's people because we are in a kingdom. Right? We're not in isolation with God. We're in His kingdom where there is peace. So in, in 2 Corinthians 13, 11, Paul's concluding his letter and he says, Finally, brothers, rejoice. Joy was such a, a huge theme of Paul's writing. If you don't know that, get to know him better because he was doing so much for our joy. Aim for restoration. Okay, 2 Corinthians, remember, in 1 Corinthians, he told the church, 
confront the sinning man, expel him because his sin is abhorrent and you need to discipline him. In the second letter he's saying, the guy's repented, you need to forgive him, you need to welcome him back. So at the end he's just saying, aim for restoration. Any situation where sinners are divided and broken because of sin, seek to bring that before God, use church discipline, whatever you have to do, but aim for restoration. You don't aim for shunning when someone's doing something wrong in the church. Your aim isn't to shun them, your aim is to restore them. If you see your brother sinning, go show him his fault and restore him. So Paul's just reminding them of all those things. Comfort one another, including that guy who sinned against all of you and is now repentant. Comfort him, but comfort everybody. Whatever comfort is needed. Agree with one another, which doesn't mean agree in our sarky ideas. It means hear scripture, agree with each other. Don't, don't keep arguing over minor points and, and genealogies and words. Agree. Make agreement the focus. And, and Paul says in Philippians, I think it is, that even when we have disagreements on some things, the Lord will make those things clear if we will just agree with what we already have. Keep going with what you already agree on. And the Lord will make those other things clear. Live in peace. Why? Because the kingdom of God is a matter of peace. We're a whole bunch of people who have peace with the king in his kingdom. The kingdom of God is a matter of peace. We should be at peace with each other. That's why there's instructions on what to do if someone sins against you. Or if you remember that a brother has something against you or you know anything. There's instructions on that. Because the aim is that we will live in peace with each other. And the God of peace will be with you. It's his kingdom. Do things his way. Aim for peace. And his and the very God of peace will be with us, enabling us to do these things. Philippians 4. Rejoice in the Lord always. Again I will say, rejoice. So again, in Philippians, he's near the end of his letter, and he's telling the people, rejoice. And make it your aim to be filled with joy. Let your reasonableness be known to everyone. Do you know what that means? Each of us who are Christians should be the most reasonable people everyone in our lives knows. They, they should be blown away with how reasonable we are. Not even that we agree with them, but they, everything should be, wow, they were so reasonable about that. We had a disagreement, but they were so reasonable about working it out with us. Like, in a world where people are not reasonable and they get offended by everything, people should see Christians as standing out saying, but those people are reasonable. You know, people who really disagree with us and are offended on our beliefs about sin, when they meet us, they should come away saying, wow, I never had no idea those people were so reasonable. <laughs> so everyone should see how reasonable we are. The Lord is at hand. That's why we're the most reasonable people. Because guess what? It's not what government is in place. It's not what issues are being pushed through by lobbyist groups. It's the Lord is at hand. That's what determines how you're living your life. Because you're in his kingdom. Do not be anxious about anything. It's very simple. Both personally and corporately, we should not spend time identifying, oh, I'm so anxious about this, I'm so anxious about that, I'm so worried, I got this or that. It's like, okay, there might be something to talk about, but not as though this is a source of anxiety for us. Instead of that, in everything, by prayer and supplication, with thanksgiving, let your requests be made known to God. And I've shared this before, I can take all the things I say I'm anxious about and do this instead, without being anxious. So I can say, this is happening in the world, and if I leave it there, it will make me anxious, but instead I'm going to go to God with God's people, we're going to pray about it, we're going to present supplication to God with thanksgiving, we're going to give Him the requests that we have, and make them known to us so that we trust Him with what's going on, and don't give way to anxiety. So there's lots of things to pray about there. And then he says, and the peace of God, which surpasses all understanding, will guard your hearts and your minds in Christ Jesus. So the kingdom of God is a matter of peace. We need to approach the king with prayer and supplication and thanksgiving and requests 
and his peace will guard us. So anxiety and sarkiness and demonic stuff will keep attacking us and the world will be against us. But the peace of God will actually guard our hearts and our minds as we keep bringing ourselves to him in his kingdom. It's a beautiful gift. But then Paul continues, Philippians 4.8. Finally, brothers, whatever is true, whatever is honorable, whatever is just, whatever is pure, whatever is lovely, whatever is commendable, if there is any excellence, if there is anything worthy of praise, think about these things. Now, when you read that list, do you recognize why so many Christians are stuck in anxiety and depression? It's because of what they think about all the time. And the church is a place where if we do this together, maybe someone comes into a prayer meeting and they're, they're talking where their mind is and we say, but their mind's on things that aren't true or that aren't good or that aren't just or they're not pure, they're not commendable. Well, as a church, we say, come on, let's pray about that and get our minds onto the things that are good and excellent and praiseworthy. So part of this is we have a choice where we put our minds and and so the scripture keeps drawing us to what is true and then Paul says what you have learned and received and heard and seen in me practice these things so we read the the list in verse 8 and think those are a lot of really big words and nebulous thoughts and amazing things and Paul says I'll make it easy for you you know what I've taught you do that you know the things I've given you do that. You know what you see me do? Just do that. <laughs> so if you're stuck on all the big words in verse 8, just look at what Paul did. Look how he related to people. Look how he lived for Jesus. And if this ever, if you've ever had the thought of Paul lived a kind of Christianity that was unique to him, Paul's saying, no, look at my life and practice them. You do it. You might not be as good at me at the start. Practice it. You know? Just look at the way I prayed. Look at the things I taught. Take it to heart. And then he says, and the God of peace will be with you. So as we set our minds on things that are objectively good and true and righteous and holy and excellent and praiseworthy, and then follow the example of the apostles as they live these things out, the God of peace will be with us. We're in his kingdom. So the righteousness and peace of the kingdom are in relation to the righteousness we receive from the king and the peace that is in him. Jesus is the prince of peace. So we, we are constantly relating to him. So this aspect of the peace, we have to understand peace is a, a central issue of the kingdom. And we should not be satisfied if we're not at peace. God's given us what we need to have peace with him and he's given us what we need to have peace with one another in the kingdom. So we should at least say, I want that. And next is joy. And, and I really want to show us there's a reason that Paul put the words in this order. Righteousness, peace, and joy. Because that's the way they happen. They happen in that order. So joy is an emotion. Okay? That's the problem, right? Right? All these Christians who are hiding their inner selves from feeling anything and thereby don't understand how justified they are by grace through faith, don't feel at peace with God, and guess what? They never know what it feels like to be a joy. But I want that to be clear. Joy is an emotion. It's the emotion of great happiness and pleasure. But because it's an emotion... Emotions respond to what we believe. So joy comes after righteousness and peace because it's our emotions saying, I am so blown away that Jesus Christ will come into the world to save sinners and make me righteous by grace through faith so that now I have peace with God. And joy just comes in and says, Exactly! <laughs> Isn't that amazing? So you don't ever try to have joy. Joy is what shows up 
It's characteristic of the kingdom when people really understand that they've been declared righteous in Christ and they have peace with God. This is the most amazing thing. There's no fear of the judgment. Perfect love casts out fear because fear has to do with judgment. But our judgment's gone. And now we start feeling joy because I really love the fact that I've been saved, set apart unto Jesus by grace through faith, given peace with God. Even on my worst day, I have peace with God. And He will help me and minister to me and change me to be like Jesus. But I'm at peace with Him. And sometimes when I know that there's been sin in my heart and God just kind of wafts this understanding that I still have peace with Him, you feel the joy rising up. So, the joy comes as we truly experience the righteousness and the peace of the kingdom. Psalm 16, 11, I love this expression of, of joy. You make known to me the path of life. And this is hugely significant. You want to know the path of life, God's showing it to you. You don't find it. He's making it known to you. And a lot of times he would make no more if we would just stop and listen to what he's saying. In your presence there is fullness of joy. So why is there joy in the kingdom of God? Because it's God's kingdom. And in his presence there's fullness of joy. And now by the Holy Spirit we have access to God's presence. God is present with us in the Holy Spirit. Guess what's the predominant thing the Holy Spirit's working on? Your joy. He's already satisfied righteousness. He's already given you peace with God. Now he just has to get you appreciating it so much that you can enjoy the joy of your Heavenly Father. Because his presence is full of joy. Come into his presence with thanksgiving because look at the joy that he has. Your Father is rejoicing over you with singing. And so joy is characteristic of the kingdom. And at your right hand are pleasures forevermore. The people who say, you know, eternity's a long time, we're going to run out of things to be happy about. Not when at the right hand of the Father are pleasures forever. Like, you'll, you'll never reach the end of them. Because He's infinite and eternal. So, God wants us to see Him that way, and now in His kingdom, we're to taste that. Taste and see that the Lord is good. Be like little children that hunger and thirst because you've tasted that the Lord is good. And so this is what God is calling us to. Now, same psalm, but a few verses earlier, okay? What the writer had said just before that is, Therefore my heart is glad, and my whole being rejoices. My flesh also dwells secure. Now, my whole being means my outer being and my inner being. We talk about the inner being all the time because most Christians are out of touch with it. This writer is saying, my whole being rejoices. There isn't one part of me that isn't rejoicing. But he says, therefore, my heart is glad. Therefore, my whole being rejoices. Therefore, my flesh also dwells secure. So we have to ask, well, what just came before that? Because if we got that, we could have this. If this is the reason, if there's a reason that I can have this, what's the reason? This is what he says. I bless Yahweh who gives me counsel. So I rejoice because the Lord, Yahweh, my God, is constantly counseling me, renewing my mind, teaching me what is true, and I'm able to rejoice in that. In the night also my heart instructs me. I wake up at night and scriptures that I was taught that morning in my time with God come to mind and my heart instructs me on the things that God has been teaching me. I have set the Lord Yahweh always before me. Guess why a lot of Christians get discouraged and despondent? It's because we live put God like a little trinket in front of ourselves for Sunday mornings or maybe prayer meeting or maybe once in a while and then he's not part of our day. He's not part of how we relate. 
And this person saying, I've set Yahweh always before me. I, I don't keep changing where my focus is. Because he is at my right hand, I shall not be shaken. So again, he's at my right hand. So on my side of strength, I don't rely on myself. He's there. I have nothing to fear because he's there. So when he says, therefore, my heart is glad and my whole being rejoices, my flesh also dwells secure. He's saying, because God's constantly counseling me and teaching me and drawing out of my heart the things that he has taught me, I am secure in him and so I can be glad. And I'm saying this because rejoicing is an emotion that comes when we know the other stuff. And if we are not joyful, it's because we don't know something about God. We don't know Him in some part of ourselves. Because if we knew Him, we'd be rejoicing at what we know. So that, that's crucial. In John 15, 11, Jesus said, These things I have spoken to you, that my joy may be in you, and that your joy may be full. So when Jesus Christ is fullness of joy, and he's speaking to you through his word so that his joy would be in you. And of course it's the picture of the vine, and it's putting its life into the branches. He's saying, my joy could be in you. Now listen, a lot of Christians are stuck in a joyless world because of themselves and their flesh. It's not because of things they've gone through in life, it's because they've chosen to handle them in the flesh. All self-protection is sarki. It's the flesh. It's self-centered. It's self-dependent. That's why we're joyless. So, Jesus is saying, today, my joy could be in you. Now, if you're driving down the road and your gas tank is on empty, are you going to just park and say, woe is me, what a miserable life I have? Or are you going to pull into a gas station and fill up? I mean, we do that with, we're thirsty, my bottle's empty. We'll fill it up. My point is there's absolutely nothing wrong with coming to Jesus empty if what he's saying is, I want to put the fullness of my joy in you. And there's something wrong if Christians won't actually go to him and say, fill me up. I'm empty. Fill me up. Instead, we say, I'm empty. You can't help me. It's like, what? That's not kingdom of God talk. That's totally sarky, roly, demonic talk. Because in the kingdom, it's about righteousness and peace and joy. And Jesus is actually wanting to give you the fullness of his joy in you. And that will result in your joy being made full. So at the very least, you should be saying, this is what I'm praying about this week. God, what are you speaking to me in the word that I could have Jesus' joy filling me so that my joy is full? And really, <laughs> there's no reason for us to say I can't do that. Well, if you know how to gas up your car when it's empty, you know how to come to Jesus for joy when you're empty. It's like, just come. 1 Peter 1, verse 8. Though you have not seen him, you love him. Profound for Peter, who denied Jesus three times, and three times Jesus asked him after the resurrection, Peter, do you love me? And then Peter would write to people and say, you've never even seen him and you love him. Like That must have brought so much praise to Peter, both humility at what he was capable of when he actually saw Jesus, and then to see this work of God in, in people who loved him, even though they'd never seen him. Though you do not see him now, you believe in him. Well, what wonderful words to the church almost 2,000 years later that still tells us you believe in him even though you don't see him. It's a wonderful gift. And you rejoice with joy that is inexpressible and filled with glory. If the kingdom of God is a matter of joy, it's talking about a joy that is inexpressible and filled with glory. So, if I'm to say, 
Jesus wants the fullness of his joy to be in me so that my joy can be made full. And the kind of joy is so amazing that it's beyond fully putting into words. It's filled with glory. That's the kind of joy I want to have. I hope this is shaping our hunger and our thirst to have that kind of joy. Obtaining the outcome of your faith. So again, joy comes because something else is true. The truth is, right now, you are receiving the outcome of your faith. You've already been justified. You're presently being sanctified. And you're going to receive your glorification. You're obtaining the very thing you trusted Jesus for. That's why you're filled with inexpressible and glorious joy. You're being persecuted, but... They're all a bunch of lost people who don't know that they can't take your salvation away from you. They don't even understand that the gates of hell will not prevail against the church Jesus is building. We rejoice because we've been saved, we've been justified, we've been sanctified, we will be glorified. And so the outcome of our faith, we're receiving that already and that causes us great joy. And of course that refers to the salvation of your souls. You're being saved. If it doesn't cause you joy that you're being saved, then you have something wrong that you don't appreciate. The wrath of God against your sin, and you've been saved from that. It should cause us great joy. The, the last part of this is, it's in the Holy Spirit. And this again is hugely significant, because if we think, I have to do righteousness... I have to create peace with God. I have to summon up joy. It's like, no, it's in the Holy Spirit. It's not in you. You don't have to have it in you. It's in Him. And this is what gives us so much hope in the kingdom. You come into the kingdom where the Holy Spirit is present with the church, and He will do this because it's in Him. Galatians 5, verse 5. For through the Spirit, by faith, we ourselves eagerly wait for the hope of righteousness. What's the hope of righteousness? It's our glorification. Because I already have justification. I'm presently being sanctified. And the hope of the full righteousness is when Jesus comes and I see him face to face and I become just like him. Through the Spirit, we eagerly look forward to that. Then verse 16. But I say, walk by the Spirit and you will not gratify the desires of the flesh. Now we know this so clearly, at least in doctrine. When we are stuck in the flesh, it's because we're dis disconnected from the Spirit. That's it. We could start seeking the Spirit, seeking to walk in the Spirit, and we would find that all of a sudden we're having victory over the flesh. The Christians who constantly have the same problems with the same sins over and over again, they're disconnected from the Spirit. That's the problem. It's not that they're disconnected from keeping the law. It's not the law that makes us righteous. It's the Spirit. And so we have to look at this. Another thing to pray for, God, I want to walk with the Spirit every day, every moment of the day, so that I am able to be free of the lusts of the flesh and walk freely in the righteousness of my faith. And then a few verses further. But the fruit of the Spirit is love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, self-control. Against such things there is no law. See, the work of the Holy Spirit in your life is to produce the things of the kingdom. It's not for you to produce it. It's for you to walk in the Spirit. The fruit of walking in the Spirit is you'll experience love and joy and peace because those are the things of the kingdom. I just want us to be so convinced of that. Ephesians 5.18 Do not get drunk with wine, for that is debauchery, but be filled with the Spirit. That's how you'll experience the things of the kingdom. Now, what is the root to righteousness, peace, and joy? How do you get there right now, today? First of all, we need the freedom from side of repenting, which is change your mind. I think there's a lot of stuff in here today that you should be changing your mind because it's confronted you with truth. And there's stuff in you that doesn't match that, so change your mind. Everything in here that you heard was true, 
and you know that it's not the way it is in you, well, change your mind about it then. You're thinking wrong inside you. Change your mind and agree with God. And then renounce that old stuff as it comes up and resist it whenever Satan tempts you with it. We have to have that. I need that freedom. But I need to agree. It's like I can't, I can't just add uh, good foods to my diet while I'm still eating garbage stuff and expect to be healthy. I have to get rid of the stuff that's bad for me. Okay? And then it's freedom to have faith. The gospel is from faith, for faith, by faith, because everything we're talking about you can experience by faith. Now I'm going to make this really personal. 2 Corinthians 1.24 Not that we lord it over your faith, but we work with you for your joy for you stand firm in your faith. I believe Paul's left a, an example to pastors that we don't lord it over your faith, but we work with you for your joy. That means you and I need to get this working. That you're going to let me work for your joy and you're going to work with me on that. A pastor can't give you joy. He can work with you for your joy. We each have enough joy of our own, but we help each other for the other person's joy. We want them to have the same stuff from God we have, but we can't give it to each other. We can only work with each other for mutual joy. So I'd like you to see for the rest of your life, at least as long as I'm here, that you will see Everything your pastor is trying to do in your life to help you is to work with you for your joy. It's a beautiful picture, isn't it? The kingdom of God is about pastors working with their people for their joy. Now, your part. Obey your leaders and submit to them, for they are keeping watch over your souls as those who will have to give an account. So part of a leader watching over your soul is he's working with you for your joy. He's watching your soul. Like, how are you doing? How much joy do you have? How much are you getting that you are justified by grace through faith? Do you have peace with God? If I don't see joy, I know something's wrong with your soul. And so pastors are keeping watch over your soul. They have to actually give account to God. If a pastor allows himself to feel sorry for himself because people are so hard to work with and so joyless and, you know, woe is me. It's like, okay, go stand before God and tell him why those people aren't worth it. He has to give account to God for that. So, then Paul, or the Hebrews writer says, let them do this with joy and not with groaning. For that would be of no advantage to you. So how would it be an advantage to you if your pastor is working for your joy and you fight him at every turn? Really? Like the kingdom of God is about joy and you're resisting a pastor trying to lead you into that joy? I just want to show how clearly it is. You have to make a decision that I'm not going to make it hard work for a leader to bring me to joy. No matter what you have to face... I've never heard anyone's story where their story was hard. Do you know what was hard? They wouldn't let anybody help them. I could tell you stories of people that they made it so much work and then they left. They fought everything. Their story was easy. They just needed healing from Jesus. They just needed to know the, the realities of their salvation. It wasn't hard. But they made it so much work because they resisted everything that was offered to them. And, and what the, the apostles are saying is, your leaders are working for your joy. Go with it. Submit to them. So they can enjoy it. At the end of the day, you should feel more joy because your pastor was helping you with what, what he had learned about joy. And he left joyful because you got something and you, you just surrendered to the work of God, and he could see that take effect, and he could go home just pleased that God did a work among his people. So, I, I just want us to be so clear that 
the kingdom of God is not a matter of, of making rules about other things. It's about righteousness and peace and joy in the Holy Spirit. And now we know we can pray about all of that and we can work together for it. And I believe it is to Jesus' glory that we would be the most joyful people in the Nicola Valley or anywhere in the world that anyone has ever met. It's what his kingdom is about. Amen.